We're going to talk about culture and, and human nature, as you will see. There we go. Humans are quite particular about whom they choose to imitate. Humans are said to have prestige bias. They're especially concerned with detecting who, detecting who has prestige, that is, who they seek others, who is they seek others who have skills and are respected by others. And they try to imitate what these individuals are doing. And examples would be dressing like your your favorite uh, singer or your favorite actor, acting like your favorite actor or, or talking like your favorite actor or talking like your parents uh, or acting like your parents uh, or trying to act like the most popular person in school. But it, let me show you some other examples. This is These are women trying to look like Marilyn Monroe. They're trying to imitate Marilyn Monroe. And these are individuals trying to imitate Dolly Parton. And these are Elvis impersonators. Imitating prestigious others is a very efficient way of cultural learning. Individuals are more likely to learn successfully if they target those people who are especially talented. Identifying signs of prestige and then imitating people who displayed those signs are skills that were likely selected for in the course of human evolution. Our ancestors who did this were more likely to acquire the highly useful cultural knowledge that gave them a survival advantage compared with those who did not. And of course, we've been dealing with this uh, since the beginning of time or the beginning of human uh, humankind. Um, we have people that stand in front of other individuals and uh, like preachers or politicians, and they are trying to become uh, people that other individuals mimic. They want you to mimic their behavior. Humans have what is known as a theory of mind. A theory of mind means that people understand that others have minds that are different from their own, and thus that other people have perspectives and intentions that are different from their own. Imitative learning is where the learner copies precisely what they think the model is trying to do. Emulative learning is where the learner is focused on the environmental events that are involved. The emulative learner is only focused on the events that happen around the model, not what the model intends to accomplish. In emulative learning, you learn one task but can't use that knowledge in any other context. Human cultural learning is cumulative. That's where we get our culture. That's where you have uh, your culture from, uh, from uh, uh, watching ceremonies uh, in the Navajo, on the Navajo Nation. And you have acquired all of this information. It's where, how we learn our language. Cultural information grows in complexity and often in utility over time. This is called the ratchet effect. Like a ratchet, it always moves forward and, forward and is not allowed to slip backward. Cultural information can continue to accumulate without losing the earlier information. And that's known as the ratchet effect. And if this wheel stopped, then wait a minute, maybe I can stop it. Uh, I can stop it. Nope, didn't stop. Okay. If I stop it, of course, it can't go backwards. That's the whole idea. That's the ratchet effect. To have cumulative cultural evolution, you need creative invention, reliable and faithful social transmission. High fidelity social transmission requires accurate imitative learning, and sophisticated communication. No species but humans have shown these cap uh, capacities. And that's one of the reasons why humans are where we are on the evolutionary scale. The larger the, the group of people, the better cultural information can be maintained and improved upon. You're more likely to encounter a successful model to copy from out of a larger group than out of a smaller group. 
there will be more innovations that come from a larger group than from a smaller group. So a larger group will be more likely to have at least one person stumble on a good idea. And an example of this, if you've ever seen the movie Hoosiers, Hoosiers is about a, a small, co a small uh, high school in Indiana that actually won the state basketball uh, championship. Uh, it was a, a town. It was a, uh, it was actually based on a something that actually happened. Milan, which is a tiny little town uh, in uh, east central uh, or west central Indiana, was able to win the this, this state basketball championship because somehow they accumulated five basketball players that were really quite good, uh, and they were able to take on uh, larger schools and beat those larger schools. This was. This is the only time it's ever happened. Almost all the, the state champions in Indiana, before they, uh, when they only had one tournament and they didn't have class, uh, different classes for different sizes of schools, uh, uh, every year a big school won. Uh, every year a big school won. The little schools, and it was that one time in, in 1954 when Milan uh, High School actually won the state basketball championship and that showed everybody that there was a possibility, but that possibility only happened that one time. This is an example. This is what I'm talking about. Big, small schools very rarely can be big schools, and that's one of the reasons why we have uh, classifications in high school sports. We also have classifications in college sports. I went to a small college, a Division three school, and. As a Division III school, we were very competitive with other Division III schools. But we used to run against, uh, we used to run against uh, Indiana University and Purdue and Notre Dame uh, in one track meet. Uh, and we usually came in fourth or fifth. Um, we rarely beat the larger schools because they had a larger, well, for one thing, we didn't have um, uh, uh, athletic scholarships, and they did. And uh, uh, we had a very difficult time. Uh, beating the larger schools. Looking at the Polynesians settling the uh, South Pacific, the islands with the largest populations at the time of first contact had far more different kinds of tools than the islands with the smallest populations. Bigger populations allow for the more rapid spread of cultural innovations. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> However, sometimes the ratchet slips and the population will lose ideas. This happened with the aboriginal population that inhabited Tasmania from the Australian mainland. And there is Ta this is Tasmania right here. And these, this is uh, Australia, which is a continent. Um, it, is in, it was inhabited uh, solely by, aboriginal, uh, by aborigines, aboriginal people. Indigenous people living on the uh, on the on the large uh, on the continent. Uh, this is an island, Tasmania. It's not. It's uh, it's far enough away that uh, it was difficult for people to actually go there. It was populated by people, Aboriginal people from Australia, and this is what happened. When the Europeans initially arrived in Tasmania, they found scattered foraging bands of humans utilizing the simplest technology. Archaeological digs have shown that the technology seen in the past was far more advanced than what was demonstrated in the current technology. Comparing the Tasmanian Aborigines with those across the, the uh, Bass Strait in Australia, the Tasmanians maintained a toolkit of only 24 items, whereas the Australians maintained a toolkit of hundreds of items. And as you can, this is the Bass Strait right here between Tasmania and Australia. The Tasmanians had lost bone tools, they had lost cold weather clothing, they, they had lost fish hooks, and they had lost boomerangs. Other groups where the ratchet seems to have slipped include the Melanesians of the Taurus Islands north of Australia, the reclusive Siriano of Bolivia, the reclusive Paraha of Brazil. Humans are a cultural species that exists within worlds consisting of cultural information that has accumulated over history. Cultural ideas greatly influence the ways that we live our lives, determining much of what we do on a daily basis. 
We are all born in rich cultural worlds, and we co are constantly learning and being influenced by the shared ideas that make up our culture. Our brain size is determined by the, the encephali encephalization qu quotient, the ratio of the brain weight of an animal uh, to that predict pr predicted for a comparable animal of the same body size. For humans, it is 4.6, or that we have a four to five times larger brain than, than another mammal our size. Only the tiny but big-brained shrew has a higher ratio than humans, and they maintain a brain that accounts for 10% of their body weight. Our brains consume about 16% of our basal metabolism, even though our brains only represent 2% of our body weight. The brain of the average mammal only consumes 3% of their basal metabolism. The brain of the marsupial only consumes 1% of their basal metabolism. And an example of a marsupial would be the, the opossum uh, living in the United States. However, most of the, mars most of the animals uh, on Australia are actually marsupials, including the koala bear, the, uh, uh, which isn't really a bear uh, because it's a marsupial, um, uh, kangaroos, uh, wombats, uh, almost all the animals there are marsupials. Tasmanian devil is a marsupial. A Tasmanian tiger was a marsupial. In order to maintain the massive human brain, the trade-off was shrinkage in other areas. The chimpanzee's muscles are 27% larger than humans. Our guts, stomach, small intestines, and large intestine are about 60% smaller than that of the chimpanzee. If it wasn't for our evolution, uh, we would have distended abdomens just like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. One reason humans were able to reduce their digestive needs is because we were able to learn to do some of our digestion outside of our bodies. We learned to cook our food. Cooking substantially decreases the amount of energy that can be extracted from food because it denatures protein and it gelatinizes starch. Uh, it makes all foods softer and easier to digest, thus requiring less energy. And when we cook our food, one of the things that happens is the fat gelatinizes. And the, then we can process the fat far more rapidly. It also, we also, uh, it also denatures protein. So if you eat raw meat, it's going to take longer for you to, to digest that food than if you cook that meat. Because of cooking, humans are able to consume foods that cannot be eaten raw. This reduced the amount of chewing necessary to consume food, reducing the amount of muscle required in the human jaw. And you can see that here is an ape's jaw, and here is a uh, human's jaw. It also changed the shape of our teeth. All we have are crushing teeth. We don't have any ripping and tearing teeth. And that is what the uh, ape has. That's what the chimpanzee has. These, all these teeth are ripping and tearing so that they can rip and tear their food. And of course, we don't really have that in the human, human uh, mouth. The average human spends one hour chewing their food a day. The average chimpanzee spends six hours chewing their food. By cooking our food, we are able to evolve a much smaller digestive tract, which freed up much energy to be used by our brains. Many primates eat a lot of fruit. There are, are good reasons to eat fruit. Fruit is rich in vitamins, carbohydrates, and calories, and fruit, fruits tend to be available in concentrated patches. To live off of a diet of fruit, you need to keep in mind where the various fruit trees are located and when they would likely uh, be bearing ripe fruit. Perhaps the greater need for a good memory and a big brain was triggered by the need to remember fruit locations. Those primates that had better skills at remembering where the fruit was would have been more likely to eat well and have surviving offspring than those who were stumbling and uh, aimlessly trying to find ripe pawpaws. And this is what a pawpaw looks like. This is actually a tropical pawpaws. We have uh, an American pawpaw, 
uh, which you find all over the East Coast and uh, all the way uh, into Nebraska. Uh, it's a tree, and the fruit looks very similar to this. Um, anyway, pawpaws. Uh, they, they taste like a banana. They have the texture of a banana. Uh, they call them Indiana bananas is, is another name for pawpaws. A number of primate species, I just ordered two pawpaw trees, <laughs> so we're going to start growing pawpaws here in Lost Nation. A number of primate species rely on uh, food sources that require a fair bit of ingenuity to access them. Some primates' food sources include nuts and seeds encased in hard shells, tubers that need to be dug up, termites that need to be fished out of termite mouths. Extractive food sources, such as the ones just mentioned, are often worth pursuing because they are rich in protein and rich in energy. Those primates who were able to extract nutritious foods were more likely to survive and produce viable offspring. Most primates live in co complex social groups, maintaining clear power hierarchies, allowing them to form various relationships and alliances. Con conflicts as well as cooperation, nepotism, and reciprocity are common. And these are uh, dancers, uh, these are um, uh, Bushmen uh, from uh, the, the Kalahari Desert, and they're performing a ceremony. The females. Humphrey and Dunbar have hypothesized that it was ne the necessity to navigate through the intricate and elaborate webs of social relationships, the need to attract a mate, secure resources, and protect themselves and their offspring that led to the development of the, of the big brain human. Dunbar analyzed the relationship between neocortex ratio and average group size and estimated that the average size of the human ancestral population was 147.8 looking at subsistence societies still in existence, Dunbar discovered that the average clan size was 148.4. As curious as that is, I'm tightening my... Okay. In uh, 2011, Facebook did a survey of its accounts and found that the average number of friends that people had was between 120 and 130. The same year, Twitter analyzed their accounts and discovered that people could maintain between 100 and 200 interactions. Any groups uh, that are larger than 150 become too unwieldy to manage without some institutional structure, yet smaller groups lose their advantages of large uh, numbers. Although primates are highly social mammals, in many ways humans can be said to be ultra-social species. Uh, humans tend to be far more engaged with others around them than do any other primates. We're constantly attending to what others are doing. We gossip about others all the time. Our behaviors are guided a great deal by what others around us are doing. We learn by imitating others. An experiment by Dean et al. in 2012, the researchers compared the ability of a chimpanzee and orangutan versus a two-and-a-half-year-old to solve a physical problem and a social problem. The child and the great apes performed equally well on the physical problem at about 75%. However, for the social problem, when the subjects had to follow a model, the two-and-a-half-year-old was more likely to follow precisely what the model did. The great apes tried to solve the social problem through emulation. Most of the humans scored 100% on the social problem, while most of the apes scored 0%. So no matter how reclusive an individual or a group of humans are, culture and the biology of human brain are bound inextricably. Humans evolved to be a cultural species, and this is a reason why you see you very rarely see the reclusive human, uh, the lone wolf. That doesn't really happen all that frequently. Uh, most individuals live in groups, and it's usually a group of about 150 people. And that is the end of chapter two. 
So I'll talk to you guys next week. We'll tackle chapter three. We'll find out more fascinating facts.